Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We now proceed to our next symposium, Psychiatry and the Internist. Now, with the rise of the philosophical concept of mind-body dualism, led by Rene Descartes in the 17th century, uh, the process of dividing human beings into minds and bodies started. And then, of course, medicine adopted the same uh, philosophy, and then, of course, medical care became fragmented to those who look after the mind, the psychiatrists, and other doctors who look after the rest of the body. And then it came to a stage where it was like east is east and west is west, west and never shall the twain meet, you know, type of scenario. And then, of course, we realized, the internal medicine physicians, that care had become fragmented and we were failing to holistically treat our patients. And then, of course, uh, the importance of trying to see the interface between psychiatry and, and medicine became important and a focal point. And then, of course, with that integrated approach, our care towards our patients have improved. So as an extension of that integration effort, uh, we at the Sri Lanka Society of Internal Medicine decided to arrange this important symposium where we are trying to focus on the interface or the link or the overlap between medicine and psychiatry. And we've chosen three very timely uh, areas to discuss because we felt that, uh, you know, for instance, the three areas that we discuss today will be delirium and then uh, illnesses in which there are overlapping symptoms and uh, symptoms which present to the internist, as well as uh, substance abuse, not quite the traditional ones, but the major challenges that we, we will be seeing today. The reason why we, these three topics were chosen was that we felt that as the internal medicine physicians were at the forefront of receiving patients who were acutely ill with these conditions, when these conditions are not diagnosed acutely early enough, there, is, uh, poor, there are poor outcomes. It has been very well documented in research evidence that delirium, unless it is recognized promptly and treated early, there is a high morbidity and mortality, and it applies the same with the newer party drugs. We are all aware of what happened in Panudra a few months ago, where four people after a party died of uh, after party drugs. So with all of that in mind, we thought we will arrange this symposium, and it is my great privilege to uh, have three eminent speakers here. May I first invite Dr. Matthew Giles. Uh, he's an acute medicine consultant from uh, John Radcliffe Infirmary in Oxford to speak to us on delirium. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Um, and thank you very much for the opportunity to come and present this afternoon. Um, as Chairman says, uh, my name is Matthew Giles. I'm an acute physician and geriatrician uh, from Oxford. And the slide here is just to remind me uh, and just to illustrate to you that Oxford is a very beautiful university city, uh, which is historic uh, and ancient in lots of ways, uh, which happens to has, have a slightly less historic and a slightly less picturesque hospital uh, just up the hill from it. Um, so that's a little bit about Oxford while I get my um, electronics to work. So um, as I say, thank you very much to the organizers uh, and to the committee for inviting me to come and present today. Um, in terms of acknowledgements and disclosures, uh, it's a great pleasure to be in Sri Lanka. I've not come to Sri Lanka before. Uh, I've worked, I've been lucky enough to work with some exceptionally talented Sri Lankan physicians uh, and trainees, uh, so it's, it's wonderful to see where they come from. Um, also in terms of acknowledgements, uh, what I'm, some part of what I will talk about uh, is based on work by my colleagues, and that's Professor Pendlebury uh, and Dr. Lovett, uh, who uh, spent a long time preparing a data set, which I'll talk about as we go along. Uh, and lastly, I don't have any relevant conflicts of interest. 
So um, in terms of delirium, it's a concept or it's a condition which has been recognised for a very long time. So um, uh, there are very eloquent descriptions in ancient Greek literature um, describing people who are delirious. Uh, and indeed, the term delirium is derived from, from the Greek. Um, and, but more recently, uh, in terms of our day-to-day -day ward work, uh, I think one would all be uh, very familiar with uh, uh, being called on call to see a patient, an elderly man, who's brandishing his walking stick and he's insisting on leaving the ward even though he's being treated for a community-acquired pneumonia. Uh, and we're all familiar with seeing again on our ward rounds an elderly lady who's a bit withdrawn in the corner of the ward, who's been uh, in hospital for some time, and she's failing to engage with the physiotherapists or the other therapists who are trying to help her get better. And again, these are two very clear examples of patients who would have delirium. Um, my personal experience, and just to talk about a, a, a case, uh, just to illustrate what we we're talking to about is a 42-year-old female doctor who uh, two days post-operatively uh, after incision and drainage of an abscess, um, over the course of the day she, pr she develops very rapid onset and very um, uh, striking changes in her concentration and awareness and she's hyper aware, she's very anxious uh, she, uh, she's worried that there are burglars next door who are going to break into the house, and she's very agitated. And again, the important thing to say is, is that that was my wife uh, a couple of years ago after an operation, uh, and it was very striking that we were quite slow in recognising that she had a delirium. It was very scary for her. Uh, we, I was quite alarmed as well, and we'll go on to Mrs Giles a bit later during the talk. So what is a delirium? Um, delirium, according to the DSS, DSM, or the uh, uh, American Diagnostic uh, Statistical Manual, requires four things. Uh, and essentially, uh, it's based on uh, identification of a disturbance of consciousness, and that is altered states of awareness or changes in your sleep cycle. Uh, it, it requires a change in cognition, uh, and that is either a memory deficit or a language deficit, or problems with hallucinations or delusions, uh, and it requires that that comes on either acutely and then fluctuates in terms of its course uh, and has got an underlying medical cause. So that's the, that's the standard definition of a delirium. So in practical terms, in terms of our day-to-day -day clinical management, how do we recognize this condition? Well, um, we, we need to identify a problem with inattention. Um, so a patient is very distractible. Uh, problems sometimes associated with cognitive level, uh, with conscious level, uh, and a disturbance in cognition, as I say, in terms of their thinking, their language, um, uh, and their memory. And the important things to say is, is that uh, delirium has a, a very variable clinical course over time. So even though that when we do our ward rounds in the morning and we see a patient who, who appears sensible and cognizant, uh, that doesn't necessarily exclude delirium because it might be that that patient later on in the day or in the evening is agitated. So we can't just take a single snapshot to exclude a diagnosis of delirium. And so it often needs for us to uh, take information from multiple sources, i.e. speaking to the nurses on the ward, speaking to a patient's relatives, to identify whether or not a patient's course is fluctuating over the period of hours or days. Importantly, there aren't any, there isn't a single diagnostic test that we can do. So going back to Professor Bell's um, talk, it requires our clinical skills and acumen to diagnose. And also it's important to recognize as well as hyperactive delirium, which is usually the agitated, mobile, cross patient. We should also recognize hypoactive delirium, which is a patient who's a bit sleepy, a bit withdrawn, 
and not quite right, or in the UK, we use a slightly awful term, which is off legs. I hope you don't use that here. Do you? Okay. Um, so that's what delirium is. How frequent is it, or how common is it? Well, it depends a little bit on uh, where you look and how hard you look. But essentially, the settings in which you will see figures quoted are in the ITU or in the intensive care unit, where delirium is commonest, um, also post-operatively settings, um, but the, 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 the rough, um, the, the approximate numbers on the medical wards, um, certainly from, from Europe and the North America, is of the order of 20 or 30 percent in medical admissions. But as I say, it depends a little bit on how you look and what tools that you use. So moving on to an Oxford data set that I made reference to a little bit earlier on. Um, these are, this is a study which um, I was involved in where we looked at over 500 consecutive admissions to our medical ward. So these are all patients who are coming in, unselected medical patients, uh, and they were screened on admission and uh, a collateral history was taken from relatives um, to look, as I say, for the diagnosis of delirium. And this figure down here shows uh, our age categories uh, on the x-axis and the number of patients on the y-axis. And the white bars show the overall number of admissions. And for your interest, the modal age, uh, which is this tallest line, is 86 to 90. So those are the, the, that's, that's the most frequent age of admission, but, uh, and there are very few young people who end up on the acute medical wards in Oxford. But the, 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 the more important aspect and the, what's relevant to this talk is the black bars which show the numbers of patients with delirium. And as I say, the, uh, the distribution is highest in the elderly uh, and at its highest is of the order of 40% in, as I say, this is in consecutive medical admissions. So just putting some numbers to that, um, the, the rates of delirium certainly on our wards uh, are of the order of uh, 30 to 40% uh, in the elderly population. And in our practice, the elderly population is usually over 65 and certainly over 75. So that's how frequent it is uh, on our wards in Oxford. So, um, so that's, that's how frequent delirium is. Next is to think about what causes it. And again, it's a balance of how considerable an insult or a medical condition is and the vulnerability uh, of a patient to delirium. And what it's quite nice when you're teaching the medical students, when you're quizzing them about causes of delirium, uh, what's quite nice is that actually all, all medical conditions can cause delirium. So you're asking your medical students a question which it's impossible for them to get wrong. So they might say, well, Dr. Giles, it's an ingrowing toenail maybe. And you can congratulate them and you can say, yes, great, you've got the answer right. And it's very nice to uh, always gives such a nice question to medical students. But thinking about things uh, slightly more scientifically, um, you can classify causes of delirium in terms of acute brain injury, uh, insults, and I've listed the commonest here in terms of metabolic abnormalities, energy deprivation, trauma, and stroke, uh, and then in slightly smaller brackets, um, uh, post-seizure activity, primary CNS infections, or brain cancer. Um, but the commonest causes of delirium are non-brain associated or non-direct brain associated. Uh, and again, the commonest cause in, uh, in my practice is infection, uh, and the commonest source of infection is community-acquired pneumonia or urinary tract infection. But again, any source of infection can be a very potent cause of delirium. Um, drugs are very important, and we'll talk about that in a second, but less well-recognized causes, and again, causes which I would ask you to be very vigilant of on your wards, are pain, dehydration, uh, and urinary or fecal problems, particularly constipation, uh, uh, constipation or urinary retention. 
Um, and as I say, those are the, the, the most frequent causes of delirium, certainly in my clinical practice. Um, going back to drugs, again, uh, it, 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 as I alluded to earlier, the, the, the list of drugs that can cause delirium is as long as your arm and probably longer. And so I've, I've listed the, the main offenders here. Uh, and again, in our practice, the commonest are um, uh, opiates or analgesics, anxiolytics and hypnotics, um, anti-Parkinson's disease drugs, uh, and alcohol. And alcohol is always important to, to remember, both in terms of acute intoxication and withdrawal. Um, and again, that's the patient who becomes delirious and agitated two or three days into their admission, uh, and uh, nobody's quite considered the fact that they're drinkers at home, and they've stopped drinking, and now they're withdrawing from alcohol. And going back to our case, going back to Mrs. Giles, whose permission I have to, to, to talk about her, um, the cause of her delirium was that she was in pain, um, uh, Although she had had a, a, a drainage of her abscess, she was still septic. Um, uh, she was on tramadol, uh, which is an opiate analgesic, which is particularly associated with uh, delirium. Um, and she was also constipated. So she ticked all of the boxes for, um, uh, for causes of delirium. So next, thinking about uh, going from, uh, from the degree of the insult to the degree of vulnerability, uh, so who is it who develops delirium? Um, these are uh, data from the Oxford cohort that I mentioned before. So this is consecutive admissions to a medical ward. Uh, and and these, uh, these factors which we identified are essentially those which identify frailty, both physical and cognitive. So that was increasing age was associated with uh, increasing rates of delirium. Any prior CNS illness, uh, be it dementia or previous stroke or other neurodegenerative problems. Um, physical frailty in terms of being admitted from a care home or care institution or needing care before you came in. Uh, and uh, also pressure sore risk is a marker of, uh, of physical frailty and usually being underweight and sarcopenic. And for those who are interested in mnemonics, uh, you can develop a, quite a nice mnemonic uh, to help you remember all these causes, which is sundowners. And again, you can, you can have a look at that in your own time. So that's thinking a little bit about what causes it. And it wouldn't be um, unexpected to say that the pathophysiology, given that there is such a broad range of causes, is actually um, very uh, uh, complicated and multifactorial. Uh, and I'm, uh, I'm not a neuroscientist, uh, um, but I can explain that it's a combination of inflammatory uh, processes and cytokines uh, working through a number of neurotransmitters, which essentially causes uh, an increase in um, uh, dopaminergic neurotransmitters and a reduction in acetylcholine uh, neurotransmitters with an endpoint of um, uh, delirium. So thinking about what to do on the wards, um, uh, there's a simple tool which, which uh, we use uh, in Oxford and is recommended by our national clinical guidelines and bodies, which is the CAM tool or the confusion assessment method. Um, which requires, which is a simple bedside um, tool, which requires the, the physician to identify an acute onset and fluctuating cause in mental, uh, course in mental state associated with inattention, uh, and also to look for disorganized thinking and or uh, an altered men, uh, cogn uh, conscious level. Uh, and for the CAM, in order to make a diagnosis of delirium, you need a um, uh, uh, both one and two, and then either three or four in order to make a diagnosis of delirium. And again, that's an example of a simple bedside test um, which the, the, the trainee doctors can use. It's important to think about differentiating delirium from dementia because that's um, a frequent, uh, uh, frequent 
factor, uh, a frequent um, part of the uh, differential diagnosis. And I think that the most important aspects are um, delirium has a sudden onset or a more acute onset than dementia uh, and follows a fluctuating course. Uh, and patients with dementia, uh, often their attention is maintained. So at the bedside, you can have a prolonged conversation often with patients with dementia, which although the conversation doesn't make any sense, they will speak to you and chat to you very happily and very charmingly whereas the same is not true for patients with delirium. And also, uh, hallucinations and delusions are more common in patients with a delirium as well. But uh, going also, but it's important to recognize about the hypo and hyper active states which delirium can be associated with. So having recognized it, what do we do? Um, there's always a question from uh, about whether or not you pursue a sort of a, a more neurological based uh, investigation for patients with delirium. Uh, and actually, certainly our UK guidelines is that actually you don't necessarily need to do brain imaging, EEG or lumbar puncture. And these investigations should be uh, reserved for patients in whom primary CNS pathology is, is indicated. So in terms of management, I think the most important aspect of management is being aware and suspicious of the diagnosis. Um, so it requires swift recognition and then treatment of the underlying cause. Additional factors would be avoidance of uh, iatrogenic harm or insults and be that catheterization, frequent venipuncture and so on. Um, be very judicious in the treatment of constipation and making sure that patients aren't in pain, making sure that patients are adequately hydrated and fed. And then there's more um, uh, soft aspects of the management, um, uh, which can be classed as non-pharmacological or nursing aspects. And I think it's very important uh, to be very reassuring to patients and to explain to them about what's going on. And as I said, uh, it can be profoundly worrying uh, both for the patient and for their family. So engagement of the patient's family is also very important. Um, uh, ward environments are very important as well. Um, trying to uh, reduce or avoid overstimulation, uh, and that is noisy monitors, um, uh, lots of people at the bedside coming to and fro, um, and also trying to establish a, a regular sleep-wake pattern. And if all of that fails, then pharmacological intervention is, is, is the next step, although one must be uh, at pains to point out that that should be avoided if one possibly can. And the indications for pharmacological uh, intervention would be considerable distress, risky behavior by the by, in terms of the, from the patient or agitation um, and the choices are usually between antipsychotic and benzodiazepines uh, and uh, whether or not one gives the treatment either parenterally or intravenously or intramuscularly um, and certainly in Oxford our standard practice is to use an antipsychotic as first line um, and, the, uh, and the decision is slightly split between using haloperidol and olanzapine. Um, of note, the evidence base for pharmacological treatment is really very limited. In terms of outcome, I think uh, going back to the Oxford data, uh, the outcome from delirium is poor, to both in terms of what happens to the patient during their admission and thereafter. And it's important to say that the rates of uh, ongoing uh, Urinary or fecal incontinence are increased. At discharge, patients need more care, uh, and the risk of death is also increased. Um, and just to illustrate this, these are um, the data from, from our Oxford cohort showing death um, over the course of time, and it's in, uh, with the dark line at the top being those with delirium, and the lighter line at the bottom be those being without. And it's important just to demonstrate, which I'm trying to do with my little pointer, that um, the rates of delirium uh, is associated with a very much higher rate of death 
especially in the acute phase. I'm going to just rush over my next slide or two. Um, there's a question about whether or not delirium is associated with an increased rate of dementia um, and whether or not the presence of delirium can trigger the onset of dementia or a worsening, and there are data to support that. So just to conclude, um, delirium is a common condition. Uh, it's important to be aware of in terms of our bedside practice to look for problems with altered mental state and inattention. It can be fluctuating, so you've got to look serially or ask people who are aware of it over time. Um, it's got a very broad differential diagnosis and is uh, associated with a bad outcome, so please suspect it and treat it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Giles. Uh, I think we will take the questions at the end of the symposium. Thank you very much for doing, achieving the impossible, a comprehensive uh, uh, presentation on delirium within 20 minutes. Thank you very much. Next we have, uh, may I invite Dr. Harshini Rajapaksa. Uh, she is a senior lecturer in psychiatry at the Faculty of Medicine, University of Rahuna, and a specialist in liaison psychiatry. Thank you very much. Good evening to you, ladies and gentlemen. And I would like to thank President and the Council for inviting me to share my thoughts on this topic. And my topic for today is three sides of the coin. So without uh, explaining that to you, I would like to take you to sides first. The first side of the coin a case scenario. This was a 16-year-old girl, like today. It's just one month before level examination. That's why this case came into my mind. And came home and did not come out of the room. And parents noted she behaved abnormally because she didn't want to come out. And when uh, she was asked to come out. She came out with a bed sheet covering her face and a pillow as well. So they thought something may have happened at school. And when they checked, yes, she was a good so-called bright student. And a teacher has asked a question. And she has given a totally relevant answer. And the students have laughed at her. So they thought, OK, you know, she's going through stress. So we'll give a little bit of time. And they waited for a day or two, nothing doing. She's talking irrelevant things. And then they thought of doing traditional uh, treatment. And then uh, still, because maybe because of stigma, or maybe uh, they didn't want to you know, call their only daughter a patient who is having a psychiatric illness, so they took her to a physician. And physician also listened to the story sudden onset, there's some incident, unpleasant one in the school, coming home and behaving abnormally, and the age is also 16 years. So then he asked to send her to a psychiatrist. The psychiatrist examined the patient, and because of she was disoriented, and referred back, and a few days later, the diagnosis was revealed, that was meningoencephalitis. So there, the treatment got delayed, and there were little issues with the outcomes were not very good. So this is a typical patient who has presented with psychiatric symptoms, but actually the diagnosis was a medical problem. And this is a very common scenario we see day-to-day -day life, and also because of the other things, it gives such a flavor, my God, this is psychiatric. You know, everybody, even when a patient uh, gets admitted to a hospital, uh, even the attendants, the nurses, and everybody says, oh, and if they bring a diagnosis card, uh, that makes it worse, because they think always uh, diagnostic, uh, if there's a diagnosis card, 
where the psychiatric illness was written, it should be always psychiatric. And then uh, this, can you spot this leaf-tailed gecko? Can you? Right? It's there. And this task is also difficult like that. Because everybody knows that's a tree, right? It's a tree, everybody knows. But it's very difficult to spot it. Now, you're not a bad doctor. Because you have experience, more, you're more, with more experience, your critical thinking is very fast. You know, I have seen patients, this is this, right? But what I'm requesting you today is think about how to spot the gecko in the tree. So these underlying medical conditions presenting as a psychiatric disorder can be challenging for physicians. And when they come to us, it's psychiatrist, it's again challenging for us to say this is not a psychiatric illness. So we both have to work together. So few points may be uh, important to consider are if the patient has normal functioning prior to the onset, this is something you have to think about this girl. She was fine up to that particular day. And also the unusual age of onset, but this girl, usually, you know, after 16, uh, and with stressors, O level and all those things, it's, it's common, it's not uncommon. But this is something you have to think of. An absence of past history or a family history of a psychiatric illness and also history suggestive of substance use uh, or prescribed medication, change or adding new medication. So usually I ask uh, my colleagues to check the poison chart, the drug chart, whether are we giving something to make them uh, ill and over-the-counter medications. They are very popular in Sri Lanka. And also the fluctuating mental state, fluctuating levels of consciousness. And also, and we think this is this illness, and when we are treating, if it is not getting any better, this, the treatment resistance is also where a place where we have to suspect this kind of an illness. And the patients with the past psychiatric history, we have to be extremely careful because sometimes their initial presentation is different from the current presentation. Recently also there was a patient uh, who had panic attacks presented with a different bipolar-like or manic-like features. So then we diagnose it as an organic brain disorder. So the, or the, the, quality of the, the, con, the quality of the presentation is different from what he had before. So if we can just think about these things, it will give some clues to identify the culprit behind. So that is the first side where the psychiatric presentations can mimic the medical illness. Then we'll move to the second side my second case. Uh, this lady was 37 years, single mother with a seven year old child. And she had a family history of ischemic heart disease. And according to her, brother uh, died at young age due to a myocardial infarction. But actually it was a sudden death, right? And uh, this lady presented with episodic chest tightness, palpitations, and difficulty in breathing. And she has gone to many doctors, and uh, many investigations were done, and already on treatment for ischemic heart disease and bronchial asthma. And later on, after passing almost all the physicians and subspecialists, and when she came, we diagnosed her having generalized anxiety disorder. And these episodic things were panic attacks. So she was treated and she gave her permission to tell her story afterwards also. Now she's again back with her husband, living quite normal life. And earlier she thought her brother died of myocardial infarction and that was a sudden death due to some other reason. 
because when the patients tell us stories sometimes we tend to I mean, we have to believe them but that is their own interpretation and so this time it's the psychiatric illness which present like a medical illness of course with a strong family history and this type of presentation anybody should include this uh, ischemic heart disease and those things should be considered but the hidden thing how are we going to identify now these animals you you may have seen this picture before some might say this is a flat fish a lionfish a sea snake and jellyfish and all that actually all this is one mimic octopus so in psychiatry depression and anxiety disorders they are like this mimic octopus they can they can take any shape especially in our part of uh, the world the asian communities they present with lot of somatic symptoms the burning sensations and sometimes uh, we miss them because we learn the icd10 or dsm 5 criteria and currently we are adding these things also because our because of the culture maybe we, our expression is different from the original symptoms and peradenia depression scale has now included all these symptoms to diagnose depression especially in asian communities so these the the these presentations can go anywhere because we don't have a referral system or uh, something like that similar to the uk patients usually diagnose themselves and with the uh, freely available private sector they might if they think this is a respiratory illness they might go and channel a respiratory physician so usually in singhala they say api mahatte kelwa mahatte leda leda yalla ganna beri una kiyala so they will go to the next nona or the next mahatte according to what they think the illness is and usually from doctor to doctor and from the close well, the patients who are sitting with them also they relate the stories and it's like a snowball Uh, little by little they are it takes its own shape and ultimately come to you the internal uh, specialist in internal medicine uh, because after passing everybody this is the la, la, one before last last is psychiatrist <laughs> one before last is uh, the specialist in internal medicine so at times it's so weird and so bizarre that uh, they have so many multiple somatic complaints some Uh, hydrogenic by neighbor hydrogenic by the next patient <laughs> or the physician and various myths and beliefs and all so therefore we have to be careful when they present always try to find out these two questions i mean you came to me because of, is is this because of the severity of the illness or the pain or whatever the symptom they are having or do you have any Um, underlying uh, anxiety or fear or something about the symptoms that is some valuable thing which you have to ask and also see whether can all these symptoms be explained by a known medical problem usually there are some unusual unfitting things like this animal who barks wags his tail but with two horns like you know there's something abnormal it's something not quite right and with that this is the psychiatric illness presenting as a medical problem and the third one the last one the, this case is about a lady a 24 year old married lady who was uh, diagnosed patient with sle and on immunosuppressive therapy as well as oral steroids and she came for regular clinic follow ups but one day uh, her husband came and told the doctor today doctor my wife refused to come she is very stubborn nowadays so i just came to collect the medicine so the doctor said stubborn stubborn is good you know they'll become impossible it's a common problem mate reassured the 
person and give the medicine and send the husband home. And then the patient came back to the hospital but in the emergency treatment unit after a road traffic accident. She had an argument with the husband and told he is, he is jealous about her abilities and talents. And then he drove his car without license or he, she has never driven a car and met with this accident. So for SLE, she was on these drugs and also we know that SLE can present with neuropsychiatric manifestation. So this is the third side of the coin, which I thought like. The, we know a caterpillar will end up like a butterfly and there are in between stages. But at times we forget if we see any, any other place, you know, oh my God, caterpillar, we don't get the nice feeling of a butterfly, right? Or the other picture where it's always there, but at times we tend to focus on one thing. So this is the other, the main two surfaces, and this is the third surface. So if we can educate the patients about, especially when we diagnose illnesses like SLE, multiple sclerosis, Parkinsonism, or any other tertiary syphilis, HIV, it's any illness with neuropsychiatric manifestations that the early signs and symptoms of or the, that, that they can present like this, um, they will let you know and we also should know and we will take these complaints seriously. So that is the third side which I am, uh, which I want to tell you today. So why are we focusing on these three sides? Because we might give harmful treatment and we might delay the treatment and also for cost for the health services and the family is enormous because sometimes they undergo same investigation again and again and also the consequences, disability and death, they're serious. So these are few questions worth asking when you diagnose a, you know, a patient who is having a difficult, atypical or a tricky presentation. So are these presentation or the symptoms are typical of this disease? Is there anything atypical here? Or are these symptoms better explained by a primary medical disorder or a primary psychiatric disorder? And also, can this be a direct consequence of a primary medical disorder? And also, is there a temporal relationship with stress, substance use or any medical symptom like fever and headache. So it's very important to ask from the patient again and again what happened first and then because, because they are also in a panicky situation they want to tell us what is important for them. So we have to listen to that and then ask could you please repeat Did fever, what was there initially fever or the psychiatric presentation or abnormal behavior or the problem. So like that, that is a very good way of analyzing these problems. So these questions will, you know, give you a clue to the diagnosis. And all we need, because I have done many mistakes in my life and we learn from our mistakes and from other people's mistakes and we want to give better care to the society. So all we need is an open mind and we have to be critical in our thinking because with experience we know sometimes this is this but at the same time okay if this is not this particular illness what else it can it can this be and also the willingness to re-examine the diagnosis and if the presentation changes or unexpected symptoms appear to go back rethink and reanalyze and this is this should be done both we psychiatrists and you uh, medical specialties, physicians. And we have to work together and this working together will enlighten this gray area of the difficult, not it's not the gray area, it's all clear, but the difficult area of diagnosis. So as a summary, the three sides, one is the medical 
illnesses which presents like psychiatric illnesses and the psychiatric illnesses which can present like medical illnesses and the third, the thin round of the coin, though it's not flat and huge like the other two sides, it's very important which connects the two sides because we know it's there. Sometimes they can present simultaneously or they can present at different stages. So all in all, our lives also have so many sides, aspects. So this is Gaul Stadium. There, uh, the toss is, uh, you know, it's, it's, we, we think that it's the lucky person will win the toss. They can't do anything about it. But we doctors, physicians, we, we can do something about things. So if we can think about all the three sides, you know, the probability of winning the toss is high for us. And come to Gaul and enjoy the cricket match, last match of uh, Hiranganah Herat, and enjoy your life. That is the non-academic side of uh, li uh, our life. So thank you very much. Uh, and hope uh, you will not miss any of these things. And you will collaborate or liaise with the psychiatric colleagues and do uh, do a better job to identify these uh, atypical cases. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Rajapak, sir, um, for highlighting that unlike cricketers who depend on luck, doctors will, cannot depend on luck, and we need to consider all three sides of the coin. Thank you very much. Uh, next, I have uh, the, pl the pleasure of inviting Dr. Lushan Hittiarachi, uh, Dr. Hetiarachi is a consultant forensic psychiatrist attached to the premier psychiatry hospital in Sri Lanka, the National Institute of Mental Health. Over to you, Lushan. Hello, thank you for the introduction. So I'm going to talk about uh, substance abuse. Actually, even though this is substance abuse, I'm actually not going to talk to you on substance abuse per se, but I would like to raise your awareness into some of the substances available in this country and their common presentation to us as clinicians, that is the delirium and uh, the intoxication, the withdrawal features. Because recently we had some, uh, the peculiar admissions, peculiar the presentation to uh, the medical wards where we had some problems clarifying what the actual presentation, uh, presentation was. Uh, so why, what is a psychoactive substance? Uh, psychoactive substance is a substance when taken in or administered into one system affect mental processes like the cognition or affect or the mood. And uh, for many millennia, for thousand and thousand years, uh, there are some evidence where these uh, the naturally occurring substances and, and, and uh, plant derivatives have some effect on, on humans. And why do humans have uh, these effects? Uh, the hallucinogens, opioids, and, and magic mushroom, and the cannabis, they have been used by the, the, the human for, for ages. Like, you know, not just for, sometimes not just to make, it, make them high, but for some other purposes as well. For an example, uh, these, the, the, the extracts of uh, the peyote cacti, been used by Native Americans to alter their consciousness in order for them to converse, communicate with their deities so or the, dead, uh, uh, the, the, the dead spirits so that they can bring about certain, you know, get to, get to know about some uh, the things in the other community. And uh, why, why do these drugs or, you know, the natu naturally occurring substances affect humans? Why do, uh, are, are these, you know, the humans and uh, the plants, did they co-evolved? Why plants have the chemicals which, you know, uh, which resembling the neurotransmitters and why uh, there are adaptation in humans to, you know, interact with these chemicals, why they have enzymes to the metabolize or why, why these are rewarding to uh, the humans. This is why actually the, uh, the substance is, you know, the, uh, the addiction is forming, but I'm not going to talk about those today. So uh, I will be discussing uh, of the substances available. There are substances, you know, the psychoactive substances, we can categorize substances depending on the, on the, the, 
the action they bring about in the central nervous system. They are raw stimulants, the hallucinogens, the narcotics, and tranquilizers, the, the CNS sedatives. So there are substances available, not only in, 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 in Western, but also in our country as well. So there are a lot of problems created by uh, substances, medical, social, cultural, and legal, and we as clinicians would you know, deal with medical problems, but I, as a psychiatrist, uh, deal with some social as well as legal problems as well associated with substances. So there are uh, these substances, tobacco, licit and illicit alcohol, marijuana, opioids, and medicinal substances are very common in, you know, the, in uh, uh, very common substance of misuse in Sri Lanka. Uh, so let's look into each of these, you know, the briefly. So the cannabis. Cannabis is the most widely used illegal substance in the world. So more than 5,000 years, people have been using uh, these for recreational purposes, medicinal and you know, the religious, as well as to make papers and, and clothes. And uh, you know, most of the, the, the ancient world, the medicinal system, they have used cannabis. Uh, the China, in India, in Arab, in Egypt, all of them used uh, cannabis for the medicinal purposes. And cannabis is available in different forms can be, you know, uh, the resin, so, you know, the, the herb, weed, or, you know, there are a lot of uh, uh, the presentation. And uh, there are a lot of names. Sometimes, you know, some uh, the patient would come and tell you, okay, doctor, I'm, I'm taking this. And you would, you might not know what actually the substance is. So uh, the, the, the cannabis being, you know, uh, uh, identified as you know, the ganja, kansa, marijuana, hashish, the grass, pot, weed, Joint Mary Jane, and there are a lot of other names as well. And to, uh, to tell you what this, you know, the Triloka Vijaya, there was a recent uh, the book published by this name, uh, Triloka Vijaya. This is actually a Sanskrit name of the cannabis. It literally means, Vijaya means victorious, victory. The Triloka means three worlds, heaven, hell, and the, the earth. So if you take cannabis, you'll be victorious in all these three worlds, I doubt. Okay, the pharmacological properties of cannabis, they have a lot of uh, the, 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 uh, the chemicals, which are, you know, the active chemicals, and out of these, uh, the nine delta tetrahydrocannabinol and cannabidiol are the most important things for us as clinicians, because these two substances, these two chemicals make, you know, different action uh, on, on uh, human, depending on the, the receptors they are working on. They have different, uh, the places where uh, these, uh, the, the receptors can be found for these uh, specific uh, substances. Uh, so uh, classically, we know that uh, tetrahydrocannabinol produce you know, the nasty effects of the cannabis, which is the psychosis and anxiety. And the cannabidiol is actually the best part of cannabis. Uh, it, it's actually antipsychotic. That may be the reason we say that you know some people who are actually you know having psychotic prodrome would take cannabis to make them better, and it has anti-seizure activity as well. And if the subs, you know if the present patient is you know more in tetrahydrocannabinol compared to uh, the cannabidiol, it's more uh, dependent forming and as well as uh, intoxicating. Uh, the cannabis. It enters uh, the brain within seconds and bring about actions within minutes and last these, the action lasts for about say five to eight hours. And, uh, and, and the, the intoxication has both the physical as well as psychological features. With these, uh, the physical features of course they might come into you and with psychological features they might come into me. So they come with red eyes, tachycardia, postural hypertension as physical signs, uh, the, the psychological, this, this is the very reason why they're actually abusing this, this substance, because of the relaxation effect, or the, uh, the elation, or the or, you know, uh, disturbance in memory and the judgment. And there are some nasty effects as well on uh, the intoxication. And, and some people think, you know, there are cognitive uh, dysfunctioning as well, not up to the level of alcohol, the acute cognitive dysfunction, where you know, this, this can impair your driving. Uh, the withdrawal, uh, the withdrawal effects again have psychological as well as uh, uh, the physical symptoms, restlessness, irritability, anxiety, uh, decreased appetite, and uh, this, uh, the withdrawal would last for about say one month. 
and there are ways that you can detect uh, cannabis, you know, uh, with different specimens, urine, blood, hair. Uh, the hair, of course, you can, you know, detect it for a longer period of time, but urine, depending on the, the amount of substance you have taken, it depends the time window you have, uh, you can uh, detect. Risk of cannabis, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think that I have to uh, they mention each of these, but there are a lot of uh, the problems, risks associated with cannabis use. Uh, there are non-medical use of cannabis as well, and, uh, and the people say, the most of the artists say that their creativity would increase, increase enhance with cannabis. But the research evidence is not so uh, the, the, the promising. Uh, you know that you know, most of the, the musicians in the world, not, 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 not just in Sri Lanka, but in, in the elsewhere as well, uh, they are you know, notorious to take cannabis, thinking that their uh, the creativity would be enhanced. And I would not talk about the medicinal use of the cannabis. That, that's a different topic I think we need to discuss. But somehow because of this medicinal, so-called medicinal use of the cannabis, there's a huge uh, the advertising campaign to uh, the bring about the cannabis into, uh, you know, in, in here also in Sri Lanka also there's a big uh, ha-hoo about uh, the promoting cannabis as a medicinal substance. Okay, then I would uh, switch to uh, the heroin. Uh, heroin, again, it's, you know, there are a lot of names, uh, the heroin being identified as in the brown sugar, dragon, uh, dope, uh, brown crystal, and there are different ways that people are taking, uh, ingesting uh, uh, heroin. Uh, the most prevalent method in Sri Lanka is, you know, this, uh, the sniffing and inhalation, that is the chasing the dragon. And uh, IV uh, injection is not very, you know, common in uh, Sri Lanka, unlike in the Western. There are, you know, uh, the physical uh, uh, intoxication. There are, you know, f the, the, the classic, uh, the physical symptoms of intoxication, where you get the pinpoint, the pupils, the people get, you know, the, 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 the abuser might get, you know, the clammy skin. They have bradycardia, lowering of body temperature, and constipation. Mind you, this respiratory depression, very important uh, uh, feature of uh, intoxication. Why I say is that, you know, usually, you know, there's, you know, that, you know that with most of the uh, psychiatric substances, they have tolerance. Uh, when, you know, a heroin user abstain from, uh, Heroin, they use their tolerance, you know, rapidly. Not like, you know, it's, it, it, the, 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 the loosened tolerance is very rapid. So after a pe period, period of abstinence, maybe due to, you know, non-availability of heroin, or maybe the person is in incarcerated, uh, when, when, you know, the next time, whenever he takes the, the substance for the first time after a period of abstinence, if he takes the, the usual amount of, uh, the amount of substance he used to take, this might, you know, give rise to lethal intoxication, which will give, give rise to you know, respiratory depression and death. And we have seen deaths associated with this kind of intoxication. Uh, the heroin, uh, again, the withdrawal again, you know, it's very, you know, the classic, the, uh, the, 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 the presentation is very classic, where you, all, you will not miss uh, heroin uh, withdrawal symptoms. The, they would come and tell you, doctor, I have, you know, severe body ache, it's like, you know, the, I have, the, the broken bones, and they have uh, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, and they have, if you, if you check them, they have dilated pupils, and they have uh, uh, the lacrimation, rhinorrhea. And uh, so th this presentation is very classic, and you will not miss a, a heroin user. Uh, heroin, again, can be used in, uh, and, and uh, this uh, withdrawal usually lasts for about, say, five days if the substance is pure. Benzodiazepine, do I need to discuss benzodiazepine? I think you are very familiar with uh, the benzodiazepine, but anyway, uh, the benzodiazepine, it's, it's not a, a substance of misuse, just you know, as a single, uh, single substance of misuse. Usually it's, it's, you know, the multiple drug users use uh, the benzodiazepine as one type of substance they use unless it's hydrogenic. Unless we have prescribed, uh, it's not a, a single the substance of misuse. So intoxication gives rise to sedation, inhibition, and relaxation. And the withdrawal can give rise to delirium. And, uh, and they can you know, have nightmares, vivid dreams, uh, rebound insomnia, kind of things. And they can have panic attacks. 
the presentation could be either you know the medical as well as psychological. Nicotine, next the nicotine. Nicotine is very you know uh, uh, it's the, the most dependent forming substance, and it's really difficult to uh, treat uh, nicotine uh, uh, dependence. Uh, nicotine usually gives rise to, you know, it's called the mini rush. The rush, the high would not last for a longer period of time. It's a mini rush, only you know, lasts for you know, a shorter period of time. And then uh, you will have withdrawal features like you know, the restlessness, irritability, and then you have to take. That's why we have, you know, the most of the, 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 the smokers are chain smokers because of the mini rush. Whenever they, use, uh, you know, uh, missing the mini rush, they uh, light up another uh, smoke. And uh, the withdrawal, as I said, it's, you know, the withdrawal is very rapid and uh, they can get uh, irritability, poor concentration, and that's why they take nadara. So these are the kind of, you know, I, I deliberately missed alcohol. I don't think that I had discussed alcohol. And, the, 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 and th these were the, the most common substances we have seen in, in Sri Lanka. There are uncommon substances as well, like you know, the methamphetamine, MDMA. Uh, so let's look into these, each of these briefly. Methamphetamine, uh, they're known as speed, ice, crystal, crank, and uh, they can be smoked, snorted, and since they are stimulants, they, they give rise to sympathomimetic effects when, you know, in, as an intoxication. Uh, the ecstasy, as Dr. Barosha said, this is the, the alleged culprit for the, the four deaths in uh, the, uh, the Panadura party. Because uh, the, when you take ecstasy, you can, you know, it, it suppresses your need to eat, drink, and, you know, uh, you can party for, you know, the two, three days at a stretch, which will give rise to malignant hyperpyrexia and dehydration, and then death. So that was the very reason, uh, alleged reason why uh, the four uh, recent deaths in uh, the Panadura party. Withdrawal of uh, uh, the ecstasy, it's actually the opposite of the, the intoxication. And like uh, the heroin, the withdrawal would last for about, say, five days. Cocaine, this is the most, uh, the strong stimulant. Uh, and uh, and, and uh, it's you know, the named as you know, the crack, rock, blow. And there are some other names as well. And it can be, again, like you know, the injected or you know, smoked or sniffed uh, through nostrils. Sniffing uh, the cocaine can give rise to uh, the perforation of uh, nasal septum. So this is a very common, uh, you know, not, not very common in Sri Lanka, but it's very common presentation in, I think, in Western. I have seen during my uh, the foreign training. Uh, intoxication, as I said, this is sympathomimetic. There are a lot of, you know, the sympathetic activation can give rise to high blood pressure. And in, due to this high, high blood pressure, they can have, you know, a lot of the bleeds everywhere, not just in intracranially, but elsewhere as well. Psychologically, that's the opposite. I'm just, you know, the, running through all these slides because I have, you know, a very short period of time. And uh, so intoxication uh, and the, the uh, withdrawal are, you know, the just opposite. Uh, excitement, euphoria are the main reason why the people are taking uh, uh, the cocaine. And uh, the, the last one, the formication, the cocaine bug. It's a very classic uh, the presentation uh, identified with cocaine misuse, where uh, the user would come and tell you, doctor, I feel as if an uh, uh, insect crawling under my uh, skin. This is specifically no, no, uh, known as cocaine bug. And it, if the person is saying like that, usually, if it is not delusional infestation, this is cocaine. Uh, uh, use. Okay, the, uh, the withdrawal is known as crash, and uh, that's how the people are saying they're having crash. LSD, it's, uh, you know, the lysergic acid diethylamide, it's uh, a strong uh, hallucinogen, uh, can be available in different forms. These are available in Sri Lanka, that's the, the issue I need to tell you. Can come in, you know, tablet form or sugar cubes sometimes, they're available. Uh, uh, in, you know, the, uh, in, they are impregnated in blotting papers, and the blotting papers are the dried. There you can, you know, uh, burn it and smoke the, the, uh, the, uh, the smoke. Uh, during the first hour, you get, you know, distorted perception, the size, and especially uh, uh, your outside as well as your own body image would be distorted. 
PCP and the ketamine are uh, dissociative anesthetics are used as substance of misuse. They, they are strong hallucinogens as well. I think some of you might have you know, experience with using ketamine. And uh, so uh, these two are you know, uh, somewhat similar in, in, in their presentation. Uh, the ketamine, there are special names, uh, the, uh, the KitKat, uh, the Trank, and Special K. And, uh, and, and they, are, uh, they can actually you know, give rise to uh, deaths, you know, if, if this, the, the intoxication is very severe. Date drugs, so date raping drugs are available in Sri Lanka. Do you know what date raping dr drugs are? This is actually, you know, when these drugs were given, given to an uh, unsuspecting uh, uh, a person, they would go into, you know, sudden, you know, the, the action is very, you know, rapid. Uh, you know, rapidly they go into, you know, groggy and sleepy, and, you know, after that they can't remember what has happened. So this has been used by the people to, you know, they can, you know, since this, uh, the substance are uh, odorless and tasteless, can be easily, you know, mixed with the, the food items as well as in the drinks. Uh, so, you know, if you, if you give it to, you know, person, that person would know, not know what has happened afterwards. So it's easily, you know, not just, you know, some you know, other people, but sometimes can be used by your own, uh, the partner. That's why these are called dead drugs. Inhalants are actually, you know, this is a use, uh, the, uh, 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 practice among uh, the adolescents. They, uh, uh, they inhale household or industrial chemicals, and, 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 and they get, you know, high and, you know, hallucinatory experience with this, and death is, you know, we have seen a lot of, you know, the, you know I, I, I visit, uh, 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 certified schools and you know children's home and I have seen uh, young children using these and they have you know hypoxia, pneumonia and cardiac arrest as presentation. And there are medicinal substances as well used by the people you know uh, there are a lot and uh, and mind you uh, do not prescribe people easily on the if they you know would ask for you these substances uh, just you know be aware of these. I detection it's uh, available in Sri Lanka. It's uh, and that's a, this is the, the most uh, significant problem I would like to you know, raise your awareness on. You know, the new psychoactive substances, so NPS. This is not a uh, very you know uh, new concept, but it has been there for ages. New psychoactive substances are substance of abuse, either in pure form or in preparation, which may be post public health threat. And uh, why I need you know and and. Uh, so according to 2017, uh, the WHO uh, uh, United Nations presentation, these are the countries, including Sri Lanka, have reported the new psychoactive substances. There can be different, uh, you know, uh, the profile of the psychoactive substance can be uh, in this, but there are, you know, the category we are not yet assigned because we don't know the chemical profile, or, you know, the psycho, or psychopharmacological, psychodynamic, uh, the profile of these uh, substances. We don't know what, what, what sort of, you know, things they actually uh, uh, bring about in your system. Uh, so there are, you know, different substances as these. There are synthetic everything, you know, the cannabis, and uh, the methamphetamines are, you know, the most of, of them are synthetic. There are, uh, the opioids, uh, uh, synthetic opioids. So there are a lot of things. And the challenge in front of us as clinicians is actually we don't know what these new substances are. And then we don't know how to treat them. We don't know how to recognize them. So we have to have actually have a little understanding. And main reason why, uh, is actually, you know, in Sri Lanka, because of the economical problem, you know, the, for the benefits, people adulterate substances. So the, even though now, uh, when, a, when a case goes to, you know, the, uh, if, if a person, you know, uh, uh, apprehended in possession of heroin, uh, the police would say the, the person is having two grams of the heroin. But in the end, after the government analysis, the actual amount of heroin in that, you know, the sample he had he, uh, he, uh, in his possession was, could be, you know, even less than 0.2 milligram. So that, so adulteration of, Substance has gone into that extent, and this 
the adultering substance, of course, we don't know what, what actually the chemical, uh, the proportion, the uh, sub, uh, chemical uh, composition of these. These can, you know, create some other problems. Therefore, we, we actually don't know actually this is the pure intoxication or withdrawal or something else. So it's a huge uh, the challenge we as uh, clinician has, has to face in the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hikyarachi. Uh, so we now know what uh, the newly appointed Supreme Court judge, Brett Kavanaugh, actually used some years ago. Thank you. Uh, in the, as the program is running a bit late, our speaker stuck to time, but we are all together running a bit late. May I invite three questions, one each directed at each of the speakers, please? Thank you, um, Oscar, Professor Giles, um, Audrey Cook, South Africa. Um, I'm, I saw on your uh, list that you didn't have uh, smoking, cigarette smoking, but y you had included it as, an, as uh, one of the issues. We, we see this as a common reason for withdrawal in the hospital when a person suddenly stops smoking and then becomes completely uh, delirious. Agreed. Whoops. Agreed. Uh, my list wasn't exhaustive. Um, so, but having said that, in the UK, um, smoking patterns are changing, uh, and actually we've got far fewer smokers now than we used to. So it's, but again, that's probably practice geography rather than... Uh, so I'm sorry that wasn't on my list. Thank you. Uh, any questions directed to either Dr. Rajapaksa or no, Dr. Hitchens? Uh, uh, my question uh, to the last speaker regarding this uh, substance abuse, uh, I am physician, but uh, I uh, came to know that this name is changing or has already been changed, that substance-related disorder. Is it true? Uh, that is uh, different classifications. In, in different classifications, there are different uh, names given to this. In DSM-5, it is uh, you know, the name given as substance-related disorders, as you said. Yes. I invite. The past president, Dr. Vasanta Disanayake, to come on stage and hand over the certificates of appreciation to the resource persons, please.